Welcome to Y Lab, the makerspace located in the basement workshops of the historic David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill, Ontario, Canada, where the doors are oak but the trees outside are maples. This is lesson 16 of our Canadian Amateur Radio training. This is on transmission lines. It's an easier section, so go for 95% on the quizzes so that you can have an easier time on the tougher sections and still pass with honors. So a transmission line is what connects your radio, your transceiver, receiver, transmitter to your antenna. There are two types, balanced and unbalanced. Balanced is on the left. It's two wires separated by a dielectric, a type of plastic. And there may be gaps between the plastic. So if you look at the bottom one, that spacer in the middle isn't continuous, isn't contiguous and the air in the gap is part of the dielectric. So the one with the continuous uh, dielectric in the middle, that's known as twin lead. It has a impedance of 300 ohms and everything's insulated. The wires and the dielectric and the air that separates between it. Open wire where you have some gaps, the wires aren't insulated. The dielectric is air and the spacers are just there to keep the wire separated. Now it's generally used for higher power and lower loss, but if you think about it, we've got exposed wires there that are not insulated. Now unbalanced is by far the most popular. So that's coaxial wire, uh, similar to what you have for your cable TV in the house, and it'll have an impedance of 50 or 75 ohms. It's completely insulated, you have uh, a dielectric material separating a center conductor and a shield around the dielectric. And most of the equipment you use is designed exactly for this. The transceivers, the antennas, and they've got the connectors for it. And because you can lie it on the ground or uh, have it buried, it is by far the most popular. You can't bury ladder line or twin lead because the dirt around it changes the dielectric properties because now you have something else between the two wires. Okay, so the characteristic impedance of a line, it's, in, it's affected by the radius of the conductors and that applies to the shield and the core, the dielectric of the coax as well. It's affected by the distance between the conductors. How far apart are they? And it's affected by that dielectric material we use between the conductors. Uh, because dielectric acts as an insulator and it will affect magnetic electromagnetic propagation. Now, it, you notice it's not affected by the length of the line. And it's not affected by the frequency. Because we're talking characteristic which is measured under a set of fixed conditions. Okay? So that your impedance is not affected by the length of the line, but it's affected by all the other factors. Now line loss, here we have an effect of the longer line. The longer the line, the higher the resistance. And it's a linear relationship. So you double the line, you're doubling the resistance, you're doubling your loss. So that resistance is the key component of signal line loss, which means less power reaching the antenna. Now, the higher the frequency, the higher the loss. If you remember, we've talked about the higher frequency you use, the more power you have to put in and the higher your loss is going to be on the cables and everywhere else. So higher frequency always requires more power to obtain the signal level. There's also a thing called propagation delay. Yes, even at the speed of light, you'll get some propagation delay over a longer piece of cable. And the loss for a cable is measured in dB per unit of length. So again, only coax can be buried. Think about it. Some of the uh, twin lead were completely open wire. You'd be burying live wire, very dangerous. 
And again, you've got the dielectric material between the two. So now you're changing that from dielectric material and air to dielectric material and dirt. That's going to change the value. But really, the, the big issue is uh, how it affects things, particularly for live wire. Coax is nicely insulated. The dielectric is the only material between the core wire and the shield. So having it buried doesn't change anything. It doesn't change your dielectric material between the two wires. So why do we have twin lead and open wire if uh, coaxial is so much better? Well, the conductors are farther apart, so they can handle more power. They affect each other less. It's easier to dissipate heat. Okay. There's less loss. And with open wire being even better than twin lead, and if they can handle more power, they can also handle higher SWR because high reflections can heat the cable. And so remember we talked about that where a lot of the power can be reflected if we don't have a perfect antenna that perfectly matches the rest of the circuit. Now, if we've got a 100 watt radio, which is very common for HF units, it's not that significant. Well, it's significant enough that we have to care about it. But if we're going to a thousand watts of power, you know, we can be generating some pretty serious heat there. So we've really got the high power rigs. That's where the twin lead and the open wire uh, provide you with better capability to handle the heat and the energy and the SWR. Okay. Now, we said one is balanced, one is unbalanced. Uh, that affects the signal in ways we won't go into. Uh, but here's something important. Antennas and transmission lines have to be matched. And dipole antennas are considered balanced. A single rod antenna, like the one sticking up of your walkie-talkie or on your car, that's considered unbalanced. And unbalanced means one conductor is connected to ground, usually the coax line. Or the, the center wire of the coax line if you're using it with an unbalanced antenna. Now, how do we match up? If we have different impedance, we use an impedance transformer. So if we've got a 75 ohm line going to 300 ohm antenna, we need a four to one transformer. If we're going from balanced to unbalanced in the middle, we need a balen. So for instance, if we've got coax, which is an unbalanced cable going to a dipole antenna which is balanced we need that balen at the point where we switch from the coax to the two sides of the dipole antenna now connectors oh if you go through the reference manual you go through other training material you will see a whole mess of connectors here's the dirty trick for passing the test the higher the number on the connector the better it is. So a PL259, that's got the highest number of any of them on the test. It's the best one. And at the opposite end, the SNA, the SMA, which is the one that's at the top of your little handheld radios, think SMA for small. It's a smaller connector, so it's the opposite. It's uh, the least efficient. Now, how well do our components match? That's going to affect the SWR. Now remember in earlier lessons, we covered SWR as standing wave ratio, which is a ratio of the highest to lowest voltage observed on the line, and that difference being due to reflections. So we're sending power to the antenna. Some of it's going out, some of it isn't. If it's not going out, it's being reflected. It's coming back. So if we have a one-to-one -one standing wave ratio, we're perfect. Our impedances match our Antenna matches our frequency, and all that power we're sending is going out to the antenna. Again, we're not in a perfect world, so anything below 2 to 1 is good. Uh, now, in the earlier lessons, we talked about the frequency matching the antenna. But the impedance of the components, if they don't match, that will affect SWR as well. So of a 150 ohm line going to a 300 ohm antenna, that alone will give us a 2 to 1 SWR 
even if our frequencies match up perfectly with the antenna. If we get a really high SWR, we need to look into it. And it could be because the cable's damaged, a connector's damaged, something's broken or even disconnected. And a very high SWR means little or nothing is going out that antenna. So can we force a match if it doesn't match up? That's where an antenna tuner comes in. Okay, so do we really need a different antenna for each frequency? Well, any given length of antenna is optimal for one frequency, and it's pretty good for the harmonics. We will lose some power on the harmonics. An antenna tuner is going to match up the impedances for us, but it's not free. You get signal loss and heat in the process. What it's really doing is getting a matchup so at least some signal can go through, but it's not a miracle. You're going to be losing a lot of your power in heat within the antenna tuner. Okay, so again, the rule of thumb is let's try and have that impedance match all the way. So for maximum power transmission, it's got a match between your source, that's your transceiver, it's got a match at the load level. So that's your transmission line and your antenna. So if you're using 50 ohm coax, 50 ohm receiver, you want a 50 ohm antenna all the way. Now let's take quiz number 16. Now we covered, there's a lot of stuff covered here, and it does help if you review the slides for quiz 17 before this one. Uh, links are in the comments section below. And again, this one is a little tougher, but still reasonable. You should be able to get 90 to 95% by running through the quiz three times so that you can afford to get lower on the other sections. Again, we're YLab. You can find us at https colon slash slash ylab.ca. Post some comments down here. Maybe we'll get around to reviewing them and posting them.